Welcome to Broadcasting Common Ground, the Deep Foundation Institute's podcast channel. In this series, Morgan's Mentors, Morgan Neesmith will be talking with industry representatives about career challenges, mentor and mentee advice. Welcome back, everybody, to DFI's podcast channel, Broadcasting Common Ground. I am Morgan Neesmith, and for the first time in 2023, it is time to move the needle on our podcast on mentorship and careers in the geotechnical world. This is our first recording of 2023, and we are very pleased to have Dr. Sina Jabin Postel, the Geomechanics Product Manager for Rock Science Inc., an industry leading developer of geotechnical software, join us today. Uh, Sina is also an adjunct professor at York University in Toronto, as well as the co-founder of TV Seminars, Inc., which produces the virtual seminars. Those are a one-hour internet-based geotechnical uh, series of seminars. Sina, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Hi, Morgan. Uh, Thanks for having me here as a DFI member. Uh, It's my pleasure uh, to be in this podcast and uh, talk to you. Yeah, well, I think it's going to be great. Um, I am a little bit familiar with your background as a rock science customer. Um, (laughs) But for maybe our younger audience or uh, students that uh, might be viewing, could you tell us a little bit about your particular background uh, coming from Iran, going through graduate school in Canada and then joining rock science? For sure, yeah. Um, Let us start from my master's. Uh, I did my master's degree in Iranian structural engineering, not even geotech. Uh, I immigrated to Canada in 2011 uh, to continue my studies in a PhD in geotechnical engineering uh, because I always wanted to do geotechnical. So I switched from uh, structural engineering to geotechnical engineering. And after five years in 2016, I joined Rock Science as a, a geomechanics specialist, basically a developer of a soft, one of the software, slide two software. And then uh, after a while, I became a 3D expert modeler, still under umbrella of geomechanics specialist. And starting in 2022, I became a geomechanics product manager. And currently, I'm the product manager of a slide 2D and 3D uh, software. So this is the path, but we can go uh, through the details uh, later. Awesome. Uh, and one of the things that we generally like to talk about, it's in the name of the, the podcast is the mentorship. So in looking back on that background as a student or a young professional, um, could you tell us a little bit about both formal mentors and informal mentors and particularly with the informal, how did those relationships start and, uh, how did they progress? Um, I I wouldn't call it uh, formal and informal because uh, they were mixed for me. There were a lot of people uh, affecting my personal and professional life. Um, I would like to talk about two of these people uh, that really, really changed my career. Uh, I start with uh, my PhD supervisor. Um, Basically, when I came from Iran, I was a foreigner here. Um, English was my second language. Uh, I had limited amount of skills in professional engineering in academia. Uh, And um, I came here to a different country and started doing PhD. My PhD supervisor was uh, Professor Richard Bathurst at Queen's University. And his specialty is mostly statistics and uh, geosynthetic retaining wall and slopes. So when I came to Canada, uh, first of all, Richard told me that go and settle down and then come back. You don't have to start your PhD right away. So that helped me uh, a lot. And then through the PhD career, um, what Richard has done for me uh, is like he taught me how to be a professional uh, in terms of doing research, how to present yourself, how to present in general, uh, how to uh, proceed with projects. And he really, really affected me uh, in my professional career. And beside that, he was like a father to me at the time. And uh, He helped me to be a better person. So I can't really call it a formal uh, mentor because he helped me on the side uh, to be adjusted in the Canadian culture as well. 
then I joined rock science in 2016 and I was lucky I always had like bosses uh, who helped me in the process Dr. Tamar Yakub uh, was the at the time he was the president of the rock science and now he's the CEO and president of rock science uh, I was a developer fresh graduate student from after uh, like graduating from university and I joined rock science and they asked me to develop whatever I had done in my PhD uh, in slide two software and uh, I did that for two years and he said yeah you're familiar with retaining walls let's do a software for retaining walls I did that too and uh, at some point he told me okay stop developing uh, because I want you to do, to do I want you to do something else. Um, I said sure, let's do it. And he said I want you to go through the path of three D modeling. I didn't even open our three D software before that time. And I said okay, uh, if you think that it's good, let's do it. So I became the three D expert modeler for two three years. And expert modeling is basically our customer. They buy our three D software. They can do the modeling themselves, and they ask for more help and uh, we do it for them so um, that was my job for two three years and then he told me yeah I want you on the business side of the company as well so go and teach our workshops go to the conferences uh, and then after two three years he told me uh, that what do you think about the management I think that you can be a manager at rock science and then he switched that part so you can see from a fresh graduate to a manager at Rock Science, uh, every single step he came to me and said, okay, you can do it. You can do uh, go into that direction. And for every step, his office door was always open and always every day go to his office. What should I do now? What do you think it's better to do in terms? Give me some advice. And beside that, again, he helped me personally uh, a lot because he's a really great person and he helped me how to behave. Uh, both of them, Richard and Tamer, uh, taught me something that you can help people anytime like that they ask you to help. Both of these guys, uh, unlike like other, like some of their bosses and professors, their office store it was always open. You could always go there and say, I need help now. And they would have helped you. Um, which these are really valuable lessons. And these two people affected me a lot in my career. I think those are awesome examples because uh, I think a lot of times when younger engineers think about mentorship, it, it's some sort of formal structure involving very technical guidance and yeah. Those examples that you provided are clearly so much more than just a technical, but the personal growth. Um, and I, I think that's what we see a lot of from a lot of our guests. Um, exactly. One of the reasons that I, I reached out to you specifically for this year is something we've tried to do on the podcast is present a broad range of options for younger engineers who don't necessarily know what uh, sort of paths are available. You mentioned yourself, you'd gone into uh, graduate school of Canada being very interested in geotechnics and devoted a good bit of time to get a PhD. I mean, that's that's not an easy feat. So to get a, a PhD in geotechnics, uh, specifically within civil engineering. So I think a lot of students don't necessarily, if they're in that sort of program, think of software development as a potential career opportunity. So if you could talk about a little bit about how you realized that that might be an opportunity and something that you might want to pursue, even though you had devoted a significant amount of your your young life to becoming an expert in the in the civil engineering. Uh, that's really interesting. Uh, and it was an interesting path. I never thought about it when I was doing my PhD, and I never thought of uh, being a software company. Um, but just give you a background, uh, in these software companies, we have two aspects, uh, engine part of the software and user interface of the software. User interface is done by software developers. The engine part is, uh, they're all done by uh, PhDs and masters in geotechnical engineering. So this is a requirement to be expert, uh, expert in geotechnique and then to be able to write the code. During my PhD, as you know, PhD, you require to do something unique and using a commercial software doesn't really fulfill that task. 
So um, I had to write my own code and I had a software very similar to a slide software, which I'm the product manager now. And I, but I wrote the software in Fortran because it was simple, quick for the purpose that I was looking for. And then um, in one of the conferences that I attended to present my work, uh, one of my colleagues uh, who is a director at Rock Science now, he saw my presentation and uh, approached me and said, okay, do you want to work in a software company? I said, I have no idea. Like it was my first experience. And I said, okay, let's talk about it. And he explained how they develop the software, how, how they do it. And I was really interested because a lot of graduate students, they like research. That's why we do uh, like PhDs. Um, and at Rock Science, what we do, and a lot of people, they don't know it, is like for every software. So we do the research and then we implement that research into the software that people use. So unlike a PhD here, the research is actually connected to a practical application. So that was really interesting to me because I could do research at the same time and then implement it in a software that everybody can use. And have, having your signature on a software, on a feature that you did a research for it uh, is really interesting because it's a very big accomplishment for any graduate student. So students and young engineers can forget about the software development part. That's the easy part. The thing is how you, you can see yourself as an expert to do a research and how we can deliver this project to the people that use this feature every day. So imagine you are doing a PhD research and someone comes and say, I wanna use your research for my everyday use of work. Uh, that's what we do basically. And that attracted me a lot. Um, and as I said, um, it required a little bit of software background. Uh, when I joined Rock Science, our engine is C++. I had no idea. I never used C++. I never coded in C++. And I learned. Uh, and in a good environment, you can learn easily. And this is what we did. I had the opportunity and I learned it. But that part wasn't the issue. So they can think of uh, a carrier, uh, any aspect. Um, don't forget about the tools. You can always learn the tools. The thing is how you see yourself uh, in a position. Do you want to finish a project that uh, that is going to be built? Uh, you want to see a project that you do a research and someone else is going to do the design and they build it? Or like our job, we can just give you the tool and you can use it for your everyday. That's a, a great example because one of the things that I, I have noticed among some young engineers is a little bit of reluctance uh, to, to take a chance or make a decision about uh, maybe being a little bit afraid to go in what they consider might be the wrong direction. Exactly. Um, so that, that description of not really knowing what software development might entail, but going ahead and taking that risk uh, and to see how that's played out is, is really fascinating. Um, along those lines for a, an engineer or a, let's say a student who is in a graduate level, um, civil engineering, maybe geotechnics or structural engineering, if they're somewhat interested in computers, apps, programs, what have you, is there something that they should be thinking of though at that stage that might open that world up to them as, as an opportunity? 100%. Um... Nowadays, um, every company, they either use a software or civil, uh, doesn't matter if you're taking a structure, or uh, I know companies, they develop their own software uh, to do projects. So, and there are different aspects. Uh, learning a language, a coding language, and as I say, it doesn't matter. As long as you know the algorithm of coding, that would be enough. The rest is just different language names and different like structures. The algorithm stays the same. Um, I think even if they are doing, I was I I have a couple of students uh, like as a supervisor or co-supervisor, and I always tell them that um, 
even if you are doing experimental job, uh, try to learn a software language as well. At some point in your career, you're gonna need it because now we are in a technology that uh, technology world that everybody needs to know a programming language. Even in Excel, like I had this, a friend of mine, he was doing some data analysis. And at the time I know how to write macro in Excel because I was working with Visual Basic software. Uh, and I wrote a code for him that I could like arrange all of his data and organize the data. And he was amazed, like, uh, why, can I, why can't I do it? I said, okay, you should learn uh, programming. It doesn't matter uh, whatever it is. It's going to help you in every aspect of your life. Yeah, I think that's good advice. Even if people that this don't necessarily want to go into software development, I was at a presentation recently about data management and the future of engineering. And the big esoteric question was, uh, are we going to be a construction company that has some technology or are we going to end up as a technology company that happens to also perform construction? So that is an interesting thought experiment. Um, throughout most of the presentations, or I guess the podcast that we we do at DFI, uh, the genesis of them really was was founded on talking to to uh, professionals about when things haven't gone to plan. So we've sort of continued that theme. Now, software is a little bit different because in the development process, maybe there's some expectation that it's not necessarily going to be right right off the bat. Um, but during that uh, that uh, entire process, can you talk about just having the mindset of encountering things that didn't develop as you planned and how you adjust and reset perhaps when that happens? That happens all the time in the software <laughs> development because we have uh, like a sprints defined, like two months, three months of sprints. And in that sprint, we have to fulfill some tasks. Uh, which are features in software packages. And now I'm the product manager of two software. So basically I'm the person who signs up on these features. So basically I say, okay, these features, they must be developed in this software because of like business plan or whatever we have. And our um, project manager takes over and plan for it. So a lot of times uh, the plan uh, is not going through uh, in a way that you expect it. So, and you have delays, you start testing a feature, you see bugs or the behavior is not what you expected, what you defined. So um, you have to make adjustments. You have a couple of options in the software board and we are, I think, more flexible because if we release or not release a feature, it wouldn't affect the software much. But the thing is you have a roadmap and you have to follow your roadmap to be to reach your goals at the, at the end of the year. Um, we have different options. It's interesting to know, like sometimes we release a feature which is way simpler than we expected. So we say, okay, let's release a simpler version, but along the way, and whenever we have time, we make it more complicated uh, or make it as we planned uh, originally. Sometimes we say, okay, no, this is not gonna be, uh, this is not gonna work. And this is not what we expected. So we scrap it completely. And I don't call it a failure. It's a lesson all the time because um, the software war, the good thing is as you go further, uh, technology is amazing. Like last year, this year is totally different how you could do things. Um, so we, lesson, we learn our lesson based on these things not going through. And we know that next time that we plan for something, we should adjust it a, le a little bit beforehand, even before starting uh, developing it. And this is what I part of my job all the time to make adjustments, to see uh, how we can uh, deal with. But I have to emphasize on something. At Rock Science, uh, the developers that we have, they are like amazing. You can't imagine these people are genius. So um, some tasks you expect like it takes a month, they deliver it perfectly in two weeks. So those examples are good examples because they buy you more time to finish the ones that you couldn't finish before. So these adjustments, uh, we have the positive side as well. So it can be negative and positive at the same time. 
And that's interesting. And I appreciate that you had said you don't consider any of that process to be a failure. It's a, it's a term that I don't like to, to, to use myself uh, because again, there are so often opportunities really. Exactly. Um, to shift a little bit though, I do wanna talk about both your co-founding of the virtual seminars and teaching at York University as well, because I, I know they're not the same, but they do both to some extent involve presentation of information to a new audience that might not have that information. So from an outsider's perspective, that seems to be something that's interesting to you. Not just, you're not just a teacher, you've gone ahead and started the virtual seminars as well to continue uh, to be able to present that information throughout your, through your own avenue. Um, why is that important to you? And can you talk about how you started or co-founded um, the virtual seminars in particular? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, first, I, I should uh, emphasize on something. Um, at York University, I'm an adjunct professor. I mostly work with graduate students as a co-supervisor or their supervisor. I haven't taught anything yet, and uh, I will help professors to teach courses. Um, but I teach a lot at rock science. So that was the teaching part is something that I was always interested to experience the academia because, you know, I always deal with engineers uh, at rock science. So uh, very well trained engineers or juniors or seniors, different kinds of engineers. But I never deal with like rarely deal with the students. And I think this is something that I always wanted to do and always I wanted to go a little bit to a lower uh, level uh, and be with the students to teach them different aspects of uh, being a professional engineer and um, that's why when I was offered uh, to be an adjunct professor I accepted right away and I said okay I want to do it I always wanted to do it uh, and I always wanted to transfer my experience to younger uh, students that was my personal interest um, and the other thing that uh, was my personal interest was as part of my job at rock science i travel a lot i go to different conferences dfi conferences like two of them every year um different uh, seven eight conferences per year um to represent rock science, most of the time to uh, present papers, uh, conference papers. But something that I noticed, and one of my friends, uh, who's another co-founder of TV seminars, uh, approached me and said, okay, in these conferences, there are every year that we go, you see a specific number of people. So the faces are always familiar faces and not really new people, just a few. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is there are a lot of issues with visa, with travel expenses, with all this. And a lot of people are not able to have access to like these great presentations and uh, progress of the knowledge in academia, in practical aspects at these conferences. So that's why we decided to do TV seminars. And the funny part is it was right before pandemic we never knew that everything is going to go virtual so that's why we call it tv seminars the virtual seminars and uh, we started in 2019 the idea and uh, establishing the company but suddenly everything went virtual and we said okay we have to go uh, otherwise we will be uh, behind uh, everyone so um that was the idea to bring great speakers, uh, top people in each field to present uh, for one hour. And we received, you can't imagine the attention that we received. We have had more than 25 seminars in the past two years and more than 40 speakers and uh, more, the average is like 700 people uh, per seminar. Uh, from more than 60 countries in the world. So you can see people are coming from across the world watching these presentations. And again, that was my personal interest because you can see my job has different aspects and each of these like additional stuff that I'm doing are related to my current job at Rock Science. Everybody knows that I'm representing Rock, rock Science. Everybody knows that this is the Rock Science guy. 
but uh, they also know that uh, I am trying to connect different parts of this puzzle, uh, academia, industry, uh, talking to people, bringing good presenters and using my network at rock science to uh, bring all these people and i i will continue uh doing this and this is something that we are planning for future as well that's great i mean it's certainly a great example of the technology that we have today that is available to bring a, a disparate group of people together from around the world and exchange ideas or present some of these topics um, well, right now it's time for us to take a very brief break and to recognize the sponsor of this episode, and then we will be right back. Hello, listeners. I'm Teresa Engler, Executive Director of the Deep Foundations Institute. And wow, so many great nuggets of information in the discussion today on Morgan's Mentors. Hope you found them useful. If you're a student or young professional, I want to specifically speak to you about getting involved with DFI so you can connect and interact with these experienced professionals and learn even more from them and their colleagues. DFI provides free membership for students and that membership allows you to join one of our many technical committees, attend events at a very low fee or no fee at all, and also access valuable technical resources such as free downloadable papers and manuals, our journal and magazine at DFI.org, as well as other technical documents from the geotechnical mining and tunneling world at OneMine.org. For young professionals, an individual membership is very affordable, and if your company is a corporate member of DFI, they may be able to include you under their annual dues, so ask your supervisor. Other activities you may be interested in are, are our annual paper competitions for students and young professors. These provide each winner with a $1,000 travel stipend, free registration to DFI's annual conference, two nights of lodging, a presentation spot during the conference, and the opportunity to have the paper published in the DFI journal. We also offer scholarships and Women in Deep Foundations professional development grants through our charitable arm, the DFI Educational Trust. To date, we've provided over $1.6 million to over 450 students and professionals. Why not be one of them and apply? Information on all these programs, resources, and activities can be viewed at DFI.org. We look forward to welcoming you, and if you have any questions, shoot an email to staff at dfi.org. Now, back to Morgan and his guest mentor. All right, well, welcome back to our conversation with Dr. Sina Javan Uh I don't want to get myself scared, but I do feel like we would be remiss if we, we didn't talk about um, some, you know, uh, virtual technology, open AI, it's a hot topic right now, and it's very clearly, even to a layperson like myself, going to change things somewhat rapidly. I have no idea how. However, if you could talk a little bit about the technology that you see coming and how engineers can maybe at least be prepared for what is coming down the pipeline. 100%. Um, it is amazing. Like I've used ChatGPT a few times and I never expected to see something like this. Um, it is great. It's a great tool, but we should be very careful at the same time. I've had experiences that I say something like give me some information about the concept. Uh, last night I did something like that and uh, it gave me some information that I found them outdated kind of because it's gathering information from internet but all of them might not be available uh, and they might be outdated and you should use your own judgment and not blindly use these tools because they are dangerous uh, you can get to the point that okay you made a big mistake and using this that's one thing but these great tools, we have two projects going at Rock Science using machine learning, and uh, we're going to add it to our software So in some aspects. And I know that a lot of people in the field, for example, for climate change, in the civil engineering, environmental engineering, 
they are using this machine learning technology and it helps a lot like uh, it's amazing we published the paper at rock sciences international conference i presented actually last week and we use the uh, climate data coming from machine learning and prediction of the future climate change on a finite element model. So that's something that will be the future for sure. Um, and everybody should be open to this. There is only one problem in civil and geotechnical pro uh, industry, and uh, we have faced this problem before, is the data. Um, we have data, but a lot of the, the, these data, they are uh, not available because of the confidentiality, because it's all goes to the business, to the clients, and they don't allow you to share the data. And to use machine learning, you need to have data. I know that I'm uh, sure that in the uh, future, we can find a solution for that. Uh, but that's something that I think preventing uh, even us at Rock Science to use this technology more. Uh, so um, if we find a solution for the data, um, that would change a lot of things in the civil and geotechnical industry. That's a really interesting aspect of it because you're right, as there have been some, uh, I guess, changes in technology in say foundation drilling in particular, there has been an increase in the proprietary nature of a lot of that data. There are a lot of people protecting their research exactly. per se. Yeah. Um, one other uh, subject I wouldn't mind following up with, if you don't mind, is I, I love data and I love computers, uh, the power uh, to be able to process a lot of data and do uh, different things with models or analysis. Um, and, and as much as I said, it might scare me, it, it does seem like we're about to open up a whole new uh, set of avenues in terms of how we analyze data. But um, if we already have, let's say, some younger engineers who maybe have grown up with uh, computing and are very reliant on using computers, can we talk a little bit about more about the judgment aspect? Because I, I am concerned that maybe we just go too far into just being able to plug a boring into a, a program and having it spit out a pile capacity um, and, and not having the judgment to know whether that answer looks good or not. That's really important. Uh, I'll give you a, an example, a practical example from our software, uh, which is related to data and how you collect the data. Um, there was a story that some, there was a measurement in a lab and they sent this measurement out to different people, like uh, different companies, 300 companies. The most correct answer came from the companies that they use finite element software and the wrongest answer came from the companies that use finite element software. <laughs> so that means that if you don't know uh, what you're doing, if you don't use your engineering judgment, uh, you are not just a user. You have to use your uh, judgment. The tools are there, even for the data management. Um, you look at the data and based on the consultation with senior engineers, uh, based on the lessons that you learn from the, the other aspects of the problem, you should judge and you can't just use the data because you have so many of it. You have to be very careful. And uh, <clears throat> I'm sure as we go forward, now it's very young, it's very new. All these, uh, we are bombarded with a lot of data, a lot of information. Um, I'm sure in near future, we are, uh, we, all of us, we go to the point, we reach to the point that say, okay, this is the data and we add a level to it. I say, okay, this is the data analysis that we have to add to the data management part. And then we go to the judgment part. So there is a line missing here now. Um, and I'm sure uh, with experience, we will reach that point. 
Well, I appreciate it. I, again, I see so much opportunity with the uh, automation of, of calculations and what we can do with the data, but I, I get a little bit concerned that the more things get automated, the, the less inclined people are going to be to remember to apply that human uh, judgment. Exactly. Uh, but Sina, I really appreciate you taking the time again to join us today. Uh, we always ask all of our guests one final question that's a little off topic, but if we're planning for season three, for example, uh, if we we get that far, uh, if there was one person that you would like to see uh, interviewed uh, on this podcast, who would that be and why? Uh, I would deal with a lot of people like uh, engineers and founders. Um, something amazed me uh, along the line, and it was the experience and the uh, stories that the founders of startups, they had along the line, the successful ones, uh, to reach to a point of success. Um, it is not easy. And younger engineers can learn a lot uh, from this past, from their experiences, from their failures, if we call it failures, from their, how they, because in every aspect of uh, developing a company, you have choices all the time so how you pick the best choice to reach to a success point and um, at rock science specifically uh, dr john Curran, uh, who's the founder of rock science he started the company from the basement of his house uh, and he was a professor at the university of toronto as well and then he started rock science uh, in 1996 and now we are in 2023 and from four or five people we are about 80 people in our main office in toronto we have several offices around the globe and um, so many people we have over 10,000 customers so this was a startup company and someone like john if he sits here with you and tells you the stories about how he reached this point, that would be really amazing for younger engineers because I have my own startup company like TV Seminars and uh, I always wanted to know what should I do next? Like what are the choices that I can uh, have to make this company more successful? So with the lessons uh, from these guys, uh, I think uh, a lot of us uh, will learn a lot. I think that's a great answer and something that we will keep in mind, uh, depending on, you never know if we're going to get renewed for season three or not. Yeah. Um, but again, I really appreciate your time, Sina. And uh, for all of the audience out there, we want to thank you again for joining us. We always appreciate you listening or tuning in. And we look forward to you joining us again for future episodes of We Talk to More of Morgan's Mentors. And until then, remember that the truth will send a ripple through your body. On behalf of DFI, we hope you enjoyed this episode. The views, information and opinions expressed during Deep Foundation Institute's podcasts are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of DFI. DFI does not verify or take responsibility for the accuracy of the information contained, nor does it warrant that the information contained herein is suitable for any general or specific use. The podcast is available for private, non-commercial use only. Editing, modification or redistribution of this podcast is prohibited. Thanks for your time. Keep on surviving.